Okay, it looks like perfect timing. How's everybody doing today? You, you don't look that happy right there. <laughs> Are you sure you're all right? <laughs> okay, good. How's everybody doing today? Good. My name is Kari Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the National Constitution Center. I'm really excited that you're all here in person. And we also have a few things going on. So I'll walk you through it and then we'll get started. We also have a big giant camera in the room with thousands of students across the country joining us online. So everybody in the room, do you wanna just raise your hand and wave to them? Awesome, they can see that, very cool. It's really nice to have our students in person, online, across the country. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go through a bunch of questions, dive in deep, and the topic is the civil rights movement. So a really exciting topic. And what we're gonna do today is learn, but we're also gonna have a lot of feelings because this topic as well as so many in American history has a lot of emotions wrapped around the learning. And that's totally okay and it's great and it's healthy. Sometimes they're triumphant emotions. Sometimes they're tragic emotions. And sometimes they're really frustrating about what should have been different. And we really want you to engage in all of this learning and experience with us today. At the end, I'm gonna take lots of questions for those of you online and everybody in the room as well. And we'll get see how many we get to. If you see me looking at my phone, I'm just looking at the questions that are coming in online. I'm not being rude because this is actually one of my favorite topics and I'm super excited as well. Now, let me introduce the two other people with me on stage. Our president and CEO, Jeff Rosen, is on my right as our robotic Jeff Rosen, but he's real and he's really on there. Jeff, do you wanna say hi to everybody? Hi, Curry, and hi, friends, and hi, Professor Jeffries. It is so great to see everyone. And for our star of the day, we have Professor Jeffries right here. So Professor Jeffries is a professor of history and law at Ohio State University. And I'm just gonna have to give you the claim that you're also our favorite professor. And the best thing about the way you teach is it's unbelievably interesting. It's so many stories that you don't know of, but he's really funny too. So just to hold the bar real high there, sir. Um, do you wanna say hello to the students and a welcome? Well, thank you very much. Um, and what's up, Philadelphia? Ah, what's, what's, what's up, Philly? What's going on? There we go. There we go. Representing. No, it's great. It's great to be here. And, and I look forward to the conversation and discussion and to everyone around the country who's online. This is great. So, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you wanted to kick us off because this is also one of your favorite topics to talk about. Um, and you're also standing in front of that beautiful First Amendment wall. So I'm sure we'll talk about the First Amendment, talking about all the amazing things that civil rights leaders did with that First Amendment. So let me kick it over to you. That sounds great. Well, hi, everyone. And Professor Jeffries, it's always such a privilege to, to talk with you. I thought I'd just kick it off by asking a few big questions about what the civil rights movement was. Uh, who some of its leaders were and what its goals were, and then and then turn it back over to Curry and our, our friends in the audience. So I'll, I'll just start with the obvious, fundamental, and important question. What was the civil rights movement, and, and what were its big goals? Well, the civil rights movement um, was an effort uh, led by African Americans uh, to secure basic civil rights as well as human rights. And we often think about the civil rights movement as occurring during a particular moment in time, mid 20th century, you know, during the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. And that is sort of the high point of this effort to secure basic civil rights and human rights for African Americans. But Jeff, as you know, there's a difference between sort of a movement and a struggle. And so a movement really requires a, a concrete set of goals and objectives, a, uh, a, a identifiable set of leaders and the like. And that usually occurs over a short period of time. It's hard to sustain a movement for four years, five years, 10 years, 50 years or, or, or longer, but a struggle is different. And so what we find in looking back at the African-American experience is that African-Americans have been engaged in a struggle to secure basic civil rights and human rights from the moment the first enslaved Africans were brought over here in chains in 1619. From that moment forward, there is never a time where you don't have black folk, you don't have people of color engaged in a struggle, fighting and protesting in obvious ways, in, uh, 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 in covert ways and overt ways to secure their basic civil rights and human rights. But during that time, over those 400 years, there are moments when that struggle rises to the level 
of an actual social movement where we have dedicated specific organizations, people and leaders who are, who are executing an agenda to secure those basic civil rights and human rights. So when we get to this period of the 1940s, 50s and 60s, that's a movement moment in this broader African-American struggle for basic civil rights and human rights, out of which emerges some of the leaders and the names that we are all very familiar with from the Martin Luther Kings and, uh, and his wife as well, Coretta Scott King, an activist in her own name, Rosa Parks, uh, who didn't just refuse to give up a seat on a bus on December of 1955 that launched the Montgomery bus boycott. But this is somebody who was a activist was active in this struggle for basic civil rights and human rights for 20 years before that day and for another 40 years afterward. And so this period is, is so uh, important when we think about the struggle for basic civil rights and human rights because we get out of that, not only these some landmark legislation that we'll talk about, but also we get these phenomenal leaders, these phenomenal activists uh, who gave their lives in order to transform America for the better. Wow, that is such a powerful and important distinction you make between a movement and a struggle. And I want to ask you now what the core constitutional and legal goals of the civil rights movement were. The Declaration of Independence declared that all human beings are created equal. That promise, as we know, was thwarted in the original Constitution with the infamous compromises over slavery. We have the Civil War, which promises equal protection of the law and equal privileges and immunities. And Congress passes a Civil Rights Act in 1875, uh, promising equality in transportation and public accommodation. But the Supreme Court strikes that down and the promise is thwarted and it takes nearly 100 years until the Civil Rights Act of 64, for Dr. King on the Mall to resurrect that promise of equal civil rights. And then Congress passes this civil rights bill that guarantees equal civil rights in public accommodation, public uh, transportation, and so forth. It, it, um, is, is, is that a broad uh, narrative of the goals of the movement? And, and how would you characterize the broad legal and constitutional goals of the civil rights movement? Yeah, so I think that when we think about the civil rights movement of, 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 the, of that of the middle of the 20th century, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there are certainly very concrete civil rights, civil liberties goals. This effort to get the nation as a whole to live up to its promise of extending equality to all people. We have to be clear that when the Constitution was written, just as you pointed out, when a Declaration of Independence is written, African Americans, women, uh, indigenous folk were purposefully and intentionally excluded. All men are created equal did not mean all men or women or African folk and the like. And so what we see from that period forward for African Americans who were, who called this nation home was an effort to secure those promises embedded in the constitution itself, those basic rights that the framers said all people, all citizens are entitled to, whether that's freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right to a trial by jury, justice before the courts, because up until, as you pointed out, uh, the Civil War, those simply did not apply to African-Americans. African-Americans could not testify in courts. African-Americans were not given that right of a trial by jury. I mean, all of them did not have the right to freedom of speech, certainly if you were enslaved, but even if you weren't in many free states, could not vote. Uh, and, and so that struggle after the Civil War is to say, America, live up to your stated ideals, live up to your promises, they should apply to us. Now, one of the things that's so important, and this is why the Civil Rights Movement is so, is so critical to understand and, and to study, uh, is that those rights that are eventually conferred to African-Americans, the right to vote, for example, uh, doesn't come about because one day some good white folk wake up and say, oh, okay, I guess y'all want to have a right to vote. It occurs because people are willing to fight for it against resistance, against people who did not want African-Americans to vote, against folk who did not want Black women, did not want women in general to be able to participate in the political, uh, political process. So the movement yields progress. The movement creates progress, but that progress is only a result of people willing to fight for it and people willing to sacrifice for it. Uh, identifying what's been laid out in the Constitution, that blueprint 
uh, for equality that the Constitution offers us, but then saying, now live up to the blueprint. That's what the movement was about. Such a powerful way of stating the, the goals of the movement, to live up to those that blueprint and live up to those ideals. You know, you know, we're about to talk about leaders of the civil rights movement, but we're he meeting here at a moment in history. And as several folks have noted in the chat, this is a time when your brother, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, um, is going to be the House Minority Leader. He's got 114 votes for a House Speaker. And your tweets over the past couple of days, which have been really funny about the spectacle that we're seeing in Washington, have been getting a little engagement. How do you feel about the fact that your brother is about to be a House uh, Minority Leader? And, and what does that say about the leadership that African Americans have achieved thanks to the Civil Rights Movement? Well, look, my brother's been telling me what to do for 50 years. So <laughs> well, America now has that chance to live my life. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about it, right? Because it, it, it tells us about the possibilities that is this nation, right? I mean, it, it was, you know, inconceivable when he and I were growing up uh, just north of you all in Philly in Brooklyn, New York, uh, that two kids taking the train to go to high school, uh, and sons of social workers, uh, that one day uh, he would be the leader in Congress of one of the two major political political parties. Um, but it's the result of a lot of work, not just on the part of, of him, but also on the part of my parents, also on the part of the community that we grew up in in Crown Heights, the churches that we attended, the, the elders in the neighborhood and the community uh, who told us when we were youngsters, uh, it doesn't really matter what you do in life, we will support it, but it has to be done in service to people. Uh, and that, that's, what, that's why I went into teaching uh, and, and why, he went into, why he went into politics. So it's pretty cool, but th this needs to be over. I mean, it's been going on. I've seen him on TV enough. It's like we can, <laughs> Absolutely. We can move forward. That's so inspiring. We're getting a lot of congratulations in the chat and it really is a remarkable moment in history. Well, I, I do want to ask you about leaders of the civil rights movement, and there were uh, lots of uh, important ones to ask about, but I'll just begin by asking whether there were any in particular who inspired you and your brother when you were growing up. Well, we've been sort of students of history uh, for quite a while, um, but, you know, just like many of the students in the, in, in the classroom and online now, you know, as you grow up, as you go through school, you learn about different people at different times. Um, so, you know, during school, unfortunately, there were a lot of movement leaders, a lot of activists that we just simply never learned about. Uh, it wasn't until college, it wasn't until graduate school for me, um, that I began to learn about people like Diane Nash, right? I mean, uh, you know, Diane Nash, who as a young student, uh, raised in Chicago, uh, in the 19. Uh, in 1960, 1960, 1961, 59, 60, heads down to Nashville, um, uh, Tennessee, uh, while Nashville was still segregated, meaning that if you were an African American, you could not walk in the front door, you could not vote, you could not shop in certain places, you could not eat in other places. Um, and, and she knew this was fundamentally wrong, but she didn't know what to do about it. Uh, and she connects with other students, other young people, 17, 18, 19 years old, um, and they begin what we all now know as the sit-in movement. Uh, and, and she wasn't just in her you know, career, again, she was literally just a year or two older than you all. And, and she wasn't just interested in, in sitting uh, at the equivalent of, Mc, of a McDonald's today. Uh, she was interested in making sure that everyone could enjoy their basic civil rights and human rights. And that meant not only taking on segregationists, those people who still believe that white folk and black folk, people of color should be separate and unequal, that also meant taking on the federal government, uh, calling to task the president of the United States, John Kennedy, calling to task uh, his attorney general, Robert Kennedy, and saying, you know, everyone needs to hear these basic truths. So, I didn't learn about Diane Nash growing up, but when I did finally hear about her, she's one of those people, one of those movement people for whom I can never forget. Wonderful. Thank you so much for telling us about Diane Nash. Uh, tell us about Marcus Garvey and the roots of the civil rights movement. So when we think about 
uh, going back to the earlier comment, when we think about the civil rights movement, we often, often think about it uh, as a sort of a mid-century moment, right? In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and which is fine. But we have to locate what occurs in the 40s, 50s, and 60s on a longer chronological timeline, on a longer continuum, because there's always movement, action, and activity. There's never a time where Black people are not engaged in this struggle to secure these basic rights. And so Marcus Garvey is one of these early activists uh, who in the 19-teens and 1920s builds the largest civil rights organization, if you will, uh, that the nation would ever see. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, uh, based in New York that becomes international, has more than a million members. And they're challenging uh, this notion of inequality and segregation. And, and saying in that same way, embracing this idea that Black is beautiful. Later on, after the Civil Rights Movement, we would hear about Black power. Today, we talk about Black Lives Matter. Uh, but in 1920, the roots of all of that is connected to Marcus Garvey and to the UNIA and to this idea of race first and talking about these notions of African of, of a connectedness to Africa uh, and a celebration of a person's African heritage. I mean, that is what Marcus Garvey, this idea of Black nationalism that he gives us, that then we see the ripples of that uh, in the work of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Diane Nash, in the the efforts of a Malcolm X, uh, whose parents were members of Garvey's organization. Uh, and so there's a long legacy. So it's important to talk about these early activists as well as to talk about uh, those who we are more familiar with in the 1960s. That's so important to draw that connection that you just did between Marcus Garvey and uh, Black nationalism and Diane Nash and, and, and Malcolm X. Uh, there's a there's a, a another tradition uh, arising in the 1940s the 1950s uh, and that's Charles Hamilton Houston and that leads in the legal fight to Brown v Board and Education and then the Civil Rights Movement. Tell us about Charles Hamilton Houston. So Charles Hamilton Houston was a lawyer, an attorney. Um, he was a World War One veteran, um, born and raised in Washington D.C. Um, heads off to World War One. Face becomes an officer in, in the U.S. Army, uh, serves as a lawyer in the Army, uh, and when he's done with his service, he finds so much discrimination, so much racism in the U.S. Army that he says when, if he survives the war, when he comes out, he is going to use the law to bring about equality. Uh, and so Charles Hamilton Houston becomes a cons constitutional lawyer. Uh, he heads up the law school at Howard University, again, just up the road in Washington, D.C., probably the nation's premier um, institution for training Black lawyers. Uh, and then he builds a cadre of lawyers, lawyers at Howard University for, for a decade. And then in the 1930s, late 1930s, launches the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So Charles Hamilton Houston would be the one who would lay the groundwork for the major Supreme Court cases, beginning with Brown or culminating in the Brown decision, which says segregation education is unconstitutional. It is his brainchild. It is his work, working individually to be sure, but creating this group of lawyers, among whom one of his pupils was Thurgood Marshall, uh, who would argue the Brown decision uh, in 1954 and 1955 and become the first uh, African-American Supreme Court Supreme Court Justice. So there is no Thurgood Marshall without Charles Hamilton Houston. There is no Brown decision without Charles Hamilton Houston. There is no NAACP Legal Defense Fund, one of the premier legal um, uh, uh, organizations defending the rights of people of color today. There is, without Charles Hamilton Houston, there is no Howard University Law School the way we know it without Charles Hamilton Houston. And this last thing, Houston said, you know, today we, you know, we often see, you know, celebrity lawyers and lawyers on TV and doing all these different things and, you know, making a fast buck. Charles Hamilton Houston said, if you are going to go into law, it's really only two types of lawyers. Um, there, there are those lawyers 
who are social engineers. This was a term that they used at the time, social engineers. Uh, and, and social engineers, because Hamilton believed in the power of the Constitution. He says, this is, we're going to use the Constitution, not because it's perfect, but because it provides the framework and the tools that we can use to bring about equality. He said, we're going to use the Constitution. These social engineers are those lawyers who will use the Constitution to bring about a greater equality. And he said, you're either a social engineer fighting for justice or you are a parasite. Or you are a parasite. He said, if you're not fighting for justice, then you are a parasite. He saw it in very stark terms. And he builds this cadre over three or four decades of social engineers. And we're the beneficiaries of that today. Wow, what a powerful way of putting it and describing that group of social engineers as contributing to this fight for legal equality in the courts that was inspired in so many ways by Charles Hamilton Houston and carried on by Thurgood Marshall. Well, that leads to the last figure I'm going to ask you about before turning it back to Curry and our, our friends. Uh, and that, of course, is, is Dr. Martin Luther King. Tell us about Dr. King and, and in what ways did he... Uh, uh, contribute to these different influences. On, on the one hand, the, the social engineers in the in the North who were fighting for equality in the courts, and then the political activists in the South. How did he bring these strands together, and, and what's the significance of Dr. King? Well, let me begin by offering a a little bit of a confession. Um, when when I when I was your age in in middle school and high school, growing up growing up in New York, um, I couldn't stand Dr. King. Couldn't stand him. This was the, you know, the beginning of the MLK Day holiday when I when I was ending in high school. And I, I was I was tired of hearing about Dr. King. And the reason why I was tired of hearing about Dr. King is because the Dr. King that I was hearing about was completely irrelevant to my life. It was it was this guy who was speaking about colorblindness and the character and content of judge me by the character and content. And it had, and it wasn't talking about the violence that I was seeing in the streets, the inequality that I was seeing in the streets growing up in Brooklyn, New York, in the middle of the crack ed epidemic. He was talking about love, your neighbors, and all this stuff. So I was like, well, I'm tired of hearing about this dude. That's because the king that I was being introduced to wasn't actually the Dr. King who existed. The Dr. King who grew up in the Jim Crow South, who said later on in life that the three problems that this nation faces are racism to be sure, but also militarism, a hyper-aggressive American mil military engaged in imperial conquest, trying to force their will onto other nations, and capitalism. Right? He's like, we gotta deal with capitalism as a problem. Dr. King had a radical vision, saying we just don't need a minimum wage for people, we need a guaranteed income for people, right? I mean, so there's a radical Dr. King that I learned about. Uh, not in elementary school, not in high school, uh, but really not until I got to college. I said, oh, this dude was serious. He had, he had a vision for a different kind of nation, one that we do not talk about. So, you know, when we think about King and, and, and what should we be learning about King, it's not about, I mean, we have him frozen on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, dreaming about a society that doesn't exist as opposed to looking and reading and studying his letter from Birmingham jail, in which he says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Only if you have people who are willing to exert the force and energy necessary to bend the arc in that direction. And then he points to young people and says, young people are the folk who have that energy necessary. Y'all are the ones that Dr. King was looking to, to create the change necessary in this society. And so, you know, when we think about Dr. King's leadership, when we think about his contributions, he's more than a soundbite. And once we begin to study King as more than a soundbite, then we find a King, I think, that we all can relate to and really learn from, that transformational King, the one who died in Memphis, not dreaming, but working for sanitation workers, saying all labor had dignity. That King I could relate to. 
Wow, thank you for uh, introducing us to the transformational king who inspired you and has inspired so many millions around the world. Um, it's a it's a privilege to talk uh, with you, Professor Jeffries, as always, and I'm gonna turn the conversation back to Curry to keep it going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. And I know that's hard for you to turn it back over because <laughs> there's a million more questions. Oh, uh, and we're gonna turn it over to you all online and in sight in just about 10 minutes. There's a couple other follow-up questions that I wanted to ask you about. Um, when we think about the civil rights movement in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know, you have the grassroots. And I think it was Ella Baker that said it's not about the burger. It's not about the cheeseburger. Um, it's more than just sitting at a counter. And you, you alluded to that. And we have the national work and the grass tops work. How you talked about a civil rights movement takes so much energy, so much strategy as well. Can you explain like how that entire system worked together and how you kind of see that as the bigger vision. As we dive into individual people, we also need to like represent the brilliance that that system was. I mean, it was an unbelievably massive machine of people working towards a common goal. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So listen, for those who are here and those online, if you, if you take away, if you remember nothing else from today, remember this, that the civil rights movement wasn't just one thing that occurred at one place in one moment in time. One way to think about the civil rights movement is to think about the stars at night, right? When you close your eyes and you're not necessarily in Philly or in New York and it gets a little dark, right, where you are, and you look up and you see the stars at night. Believe it or not, and I didn't realize this until I got out of New York City, there are stars that cover the sky. There's a star covering every inch of the sky. We don't always see them. Why? because some stars are burning a little bit more brightly than others. Some uh, are burning more intensely than others. That's what the civil rights movement was. All those stars represent different local communities, different communities across the nation. No matter what community there was or you look at, there was some kind of activism going on. The persistence of resistance, no matter where you were, black folk were engaged in fighting against white supremacy. They, those communities were those stars. Sometimes those stars burning intensely and brightly meant that they were organizing publicly. They were engaged in public protest. Sometimes you couldn't even recognize the star. Didn't mean that there weren't people there. It just meant they weren't organized in a very public fashion. So once you take those most intense stars, those communities that are on the move, that are organizing, then think about the constellations that you see. Right? When, you're, it, when you're in class and you, uh, astronomy class, and you see the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, you, the constellations, those are the connections between communities. And that gives us a new intensity for the movement. You're drawing those lines between these different stars, between these different communities. And the national organizations and national organizers like an Ella Baker, member, like a Mega Evers for uh, the NAACP, like a Dr. King for SCLC, like a Diane Nash or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They're the ones that connect the communities. They're the ones that connect the stars. And so that's what the movement was. It was a series of local efforts right here in Philadelphia, on the ground, organizing for basic worker, workers' rights so African-Americans could gain access to unions and get into the construction industry. So the African-Americans and people of color here in Philadelphia could actually purchase homes that members of the white community uh, were excluding uh, them from. And it was those activists, when, when Philadelphia begins to burn a little bit more brightly, that get connected with activists in New York, get connected with activists down in Atlanta. That's what the civil rights movement was, and that's how it, how it worked. And it represents the power of the ones that you don't even see. So there's a million stories, like there's a million stars out there of people doing the work to make the change. And they're still there, even though you can't see it. I think that's unbelievably powerful. Another group that I like, we, I think we should talk about more is the children in this movement. Cause it isn't just, you know, adults. It isn't just men, it's women, but it's also children. And, and I know this is a really sad story, but I also think of how much of a turning point, tipping point, little big bang theory, since we're on the star point, was Emmett Till? Right, so Emmett Till is a young 14 year old 
uh, African American uh, boy who lived in Chicago um, in uh, 1955. Uh, and during the summer of 1955, uh, his mother, uh, Mamie Till, uh, sends Emmett back south uh, to Mississippi uh, to spend the summer with his grandparents, with his uncles, those uncles and his cousins. I'm sure some of y'all, you know, your parents want it. My parents used to do that with me, right? My, me and my brother send us to Jersey. We thought we were supposed to be going on vacation. They just wanted us out the house. But she was sending him down to Mississippi to be with his family, to be with his friends during the summer. And while he's in Mississippi, while he's in a store in Mississippi, a white-owned store in Mississippi, he's accused of saying something or whistling at a white woman who's a store clerk, 14 years old. And two days later, he's, he winds up dead. Two days later, he's, he winds up dead. He's shot through the head, he's beaten, and he's thrown in the Tallahatchie River. The two men who did it are brought to trial in Mississippi. It's clear that they did it. There are witnesses to his kidnapping and to his killing. And an all white, all male jury find them not guilty. Will never serve, never served a day in jail. Now, in many ways, that was not unique. Sadly, the story of racial violence and racial terrorism in America is an old one. But what made this particular killing, this particular murder unique is what Emmett Till's mother did. When Emmett Till's body is finally recovered, it's sent back to Chicago. And it's in terrible shape. I mean, his, his face is bloated. I mean, he had been beaten, he had been shot. And is sent back to, Mrs. To, to Chicago with instructions from the coroner not to open the casket. The body is unrecognizable. And her, his mother says, open the casket. I need to see my son. And then when she sees him, she sees what terrible condition young Emmett Till's body is in. She makes another faithful decision. She says, I'm going to have an open casket funeral because the whole world needs to see what Mississippi, what Jim Crow, what segregation, what white supremacy did to my son. And she holds an open casket funeral in which tens of thousands of people come by and bear witness to this tragedy. And an African-American magazine takes a picture of Emmett Till's body and, 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 and holds it uh, um, next to a picture uh, that he had when he was alive. And you can see the distortion. You can see the difference. And young people your age see that picture in that magazine. And they recognize and understand that that's them. That if, if, if they had been sent south, that's them. That Emmett Till is them. And guess what happens? Five years from now, when those kids who are 14 and 15 years old, who are learning about and seeing what happened to Emmett Till, wind up in college, those are the students, those are the young people who will lead the sit-in movement. That was Diane Nash. That was John Lewis. That was Bernard Lafayette. That was the Emmett Till generation. Because they understood that this could be them. Just like a few years ago, something very similar happened in Florida with a young boy by the name of Trayvon Martin. Just like we saw just two years ago in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the killing of George Floyd. And in the wake of that, tens of millions of people taking to the streets, recognizing that what caused his death could cause our very own a George Floyd generation. That's what you all are in part.
Thank you. That was perfect. Um, now we're going to have questions from the audience. If you have a question, um, the team online is going to send it to me on my phone. If you have a question in the room, you can raise your hand and Natalie, Ms. Natalie and Miss Brittany will come to the mics and walk the mic over to you. So think about your question, get it ready. They will get it to you. Um, and one of the questions that I have online that is very similar to question that we've been thinking about today we, you know, we talk about the 1860s. I always think of the 1860s to the 18, like 90s as the first civil rights movement. I think of the 1950s, 40s to 60s, the second civil rights movement. What's on the docket for the next civil rights movement? That's a great uh, a question of what's, what's next? What's ahead of us? Part of what is ahead of us is defending what was secured both in that first wave as well as the second wave, right? So, I mean, we're fighting to Kate right now, uh, the 14th Amendment to, to be applied uh, in its original intent to protect the basic civil rights and civil liberties and equality under the law for, for African Americans. We're, we're fighting to maintain uh, access to quality schools. Uh, to fight against segregation. Uh, we're fighting to preserve access, equal access to the ballot box, to, to, to voting. Uh, and so certainly people want to continue an activist and the front line is going to be looking ahead, all right? You know, organizing around questions of police violence and racial terrorism to be sure, you know, climate justice to be sure, but it's also about preserving the gains that we've had up until this moment because progress isn't perpetual. There's no guarantee. We just saw this with the rolling back of Roe v. Wade uh, and reproductive rights and, 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 and bodily autonomy for women. Nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. It always has to be fought for. So moving forward, it's going to be about fighting to preserve that which had been gained, but then also fighting to expand so we're expanding rights into the LGBTQ community, expanding rights for trans kids and the like. It's expansion as well as preservation. Sisyphus. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big boulder up a hill. So Amy has a question for you um, and said, do you, do you like your job, Professor Jeffries? <laughs> I love that question. Do I like my job? Do I like my job as a, as a, as a, as a college professor? Oh, absolutely. I love teaching. I love teaching. Um, I love teaching in the classroom. I love teaching at Ohio State, which they were the national championship football, but it is what it is. I love teaching, absolutely. Um, and I love teaching at the college level because it allows me not only to engage with students, and I always feed off the energy of young people. I learn as much from my students as I try to teach them. Uh, but as a college professor, I'm also given the opportunity to continue to learn, to do research, uh, to ask questions of activists, I study the 1960s, I study civil rights activists and the like. Uh, and so I get a wonderful balance of actually being in a classroom, engaging with students, uh, but then also uh, continuing to research and learn because learning is a lifelong endeavor. Um, but then I get the opportunity to come and hang out with y'all here uh, and, 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 and talk to students, uh, you know, uh, who are in high school and middle, middle school. So that's always, so that's always cool. So yeah, I love it. And I feel like you're always on the move too. So you're all over. Um, Brittany or Natalie, do you have questions? Go for it. Hello, my name is Zaira and I go to Constitution High School. So you talked a lot about, and you mentioned a lot of organizations in um, people fighting the racial injustice um, against Black people, but how come you didn't mention the Black Panther Party and where would you place them when talking about the civil rights movement? Great question. So the Black Panther Party, um, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, so there's, there's two, I actually wrote a book on the original Black Panther Party, uh, which was, uh, which comes out of Alabama, which was a uh, political party um, but I think you're referring to probably the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which was inspired by that original uh, political party in Alabama in 1965. Uh, and the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense emerges in Oakland, California in 1966. And it, it is in, in many ways an heir to um, the civil rights activism that comes before it. it. It really is the iconic organization of the Black Power era. 
And so the Black Power era is not a radical break from the civil rights era that we're talking about. It's a logical extension of it. And so the Black Panthers are a logical extension of two things, both the, the gains that which civil rights activists, earlier activists have been able to secure, but also the slow pace of progress. Oakland, California is not Birmingham, Alabama. It's not rural Alabama. And so things weren't changing at the same pace as they were changing in the South. And so the Black Panther Party begins to work uh, to create that change in those places that had not been touched earlier. And they were active not only in Oakland, California, but they were very active, had a very active chapter right here in Philadelphia. Um, and so, you know, they were working in Philadelphia uh, to push, again, that perpetual, perpetual um, or, or the persistence of resistance. It's always there. So the Black Panther Party represents that next phase of organization. And fast forward another 30, 40 years, we're going to have those civil rights organizations, we're going to have those Black Power organizations like the Black Panther Party. And now we have those organizations tied to the movement to securing Black lives. It's all on a continuum, right? We just have to locate, well, what part of the continuum of resistance are we talking about? We move into that late 60s, early 70s, that's when we hit the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So thank you for that great question. Good question. And if we had more time, there were so many other people we could pull in too. So I'm glad you asked about it. Brittany. Um, so as a Black, as an African-American man, how did you deal with your anger of feelings while learning about all these historic facts? Yeah, that's a great question. So the history, when we're looking at African-American history, when we're looking at U.S. history, there's a lot of tragedy in it. Learning about Emmett Till, learning about racial violence and slavery, learning about slavery. There's a lot of tragedy. It's not easy. I call it hard history. Partly because it's difficult, difficult to talk about white supremacy, difficult to talk about racial terrorism. I'm a person who's descended from enslaved folk, whose family grew up in the, the segregated South before migrating to Ohio and then to New York and to New Jersey. So it's a lot of tough history. So I get what you're saying. It's a mixed bag of emotions. Sometimes I read stuff, I got to close the book, I got to turn it off, turn the TV off because it's like, I can't deal with this right now. But the thing is, you got to balance that hard history, that difficult history, with those aspects of history from which you can draw strength and empowerment and encouragement. And that doesn't mean turn away from, example, talking about the institution of slavery. I'm like, no, there's the story, the power in survival and the ways in which Black folk who were held in bondage, you say, you're looking to slavery for empowerment. Oh, absolutely. Like, that's, that's where the American story is when you have folk who were born into bondage and will never see freedom in their lifetime, are able to love, or love each other, are able to resist in ways that affirm their own humanity and never give up hope. If they're able to survive, if they're able never to give up hope, then we certainly can. So learning about the difficult stuff, learning about the hard stuff has to be done in conjunction with learning about those elements of the past and the people of the past who, who we can look to for inspiration, who we can look to for models of, of perseverance and draw on their strength. If, if our ancestors could survive the Middle Passage, there's nothing that we can't survive today. Nothing. So the, the, so the hope is in knowing the fullness of the struggle, the fullness of the story. Because it's not just about pain, although the pain is real. And therapists will tell you, you can't deal with the joy unless you deal and acknowledge the pain. So we have to deal with the pain, but we don't let it become immobilizing. We don't let it paralyze us. And the only way to do that is to look at the other side, the ways in which our people survive. And once we see that, once we see the, the courage that they display, that's when the smile comes. That's when the encouragement comes. That's when you say, yo, I want to be like Diane Nash. That sister was bad, right? That's where, that, that, that keeps me going. That keeps me going. Thank you. Hi, I'm Niara and I'm, I'm from, 
I am. <laughs> I'm Niara and I'm from Camden Academy, Mr. Max AP History, African History class. And my question is, how did the COINTELPRO influence the demons of the civil rights and black power movement? So, so y'all aren't playing with these questions. The COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, uh, was a, a program that was run by the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, that was designed. It was unconstitutional. Talking about the Constitution, it was unconstitutional what they were doing. But it was a program in which the FBI um, targeted uh, organizations that were working to bring about social change. And by targeted, I mean, that ranged from everything from, you know, you know, trying to uh, frame activists uh, to actual assassinations, right? The killing of Fred Hampton, uh, who was one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party in, 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 uh, in Chicago, Illinois in 1965, was part of the federal government working with the state of Illinois police to undermine and destroy the Black Panther Party chapter in Oakland, California. So when we look back, sometimes we look back, uh, Curry, at the 1960s, and we say, well, what happened to those organizations? What happened to the Black Panther Party? Well, part of what happened to them is they get attacked by the federal government, by state government, in a direct effort to undermine their efforts. And it, it finally comes out, because it's a secret program, it finally comes out in the 1970s, and even activists were like, well, we knew we were upset in the government, but we didn't realize they were coming after us in the ways in which they were. And even to this day, there are still activists from the late 60s and early 1970s who were still in prison, political prisoners, as they were set up and, and wrongly charged and accused uh, from activism that they were engaged in then. So it's important that we look at this moment in American history to make sure that we always hold our government accountable. Always hold them accountable. My brother, as we mentioned earlier, uh, who is, you know, who the congressman and, and you know leader, you know, he said he said to me, you know, one day we we were talking, and he's like, yeah, he said, you know, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, federal government, man, you, you got to be careful about them. So I'm worried about that, you know, you're worried about the man. And I was like, dude, you are the man now. What are you talking about? We got to hold them accountable. Always hold them accountable. And that's one of the lessons that comes out of studying uh, COINTELPRO. That's a great question. That must make family parties totally different. Oh, now. everything. Everything is different. <laughs> um, okay, we have one last question. I have one online, but if we have one here, go for it. And I'll try to sneak in the one online too. Um, hi, I'm Chinoya from Sichuan New Charter High School. And my question is that I heard you talking about civil rights movement and naming persons who was a part of it. And I was just wondering, wasn't um, Nanny of the Maroon part of that civil rights movement? Was who a part of it? I didn't catch that part. Nanny of the Maroon. Nanny of the Maroons? Mm -hmm. Oh, so, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't say so the, the, the Maroons, if, if, if I understand the question right. So the, when we're talking about the, the era of slavery, right? One of the ways in which African Americans and slave people resisted um, was they would run away. And we often think about the Underground Railroad and, and enslaved people running to Ohio and to Canada. But most people, if you were enslaved in a place like North Carolina, you would never get to Ohio, right? And certainly during the colonial period, all those colonies had slavery. So what you would do is you would head to the swamps. You would, you would go to places that were, that were uninhabited. In North Carolina, you would go to the Great Dismal Swamp. And in there, you would establish your own communities of, free, of people who freed themselves. And these were called maroon societies. And they were much more common down in Latin America or South America and Latin America and Central America where slavery was, where you had a greater terrain. But we even saw that here. And so you're absolutely right. I wouldn't frame it as civil rights because that's not the civil rights. They're not fighting for civil. They're fighting for their human rights. That's part of that broader African-American struggle, learning about those maroon societies uh, that would maintain their independence for generations in many instances. So put that on the continuum of African-American resistance. That's just at the very beginning. Fantastic. I know we have to wrap up now, but I did, I just, there were so many things in this conversation that 
that pulled in big ideas that we shouldn't ever walk away from. And when we're looking at history, whatever the topic we're digging into, you, you taught a really amazing, powerful lesson in be careful how you single story people. You talked about Rosa Parks. You talked about Martin Luther King, because that can be in a positive or a negative. You give them one moment in time and only focus on that, but there's so much more to them and to really pull that through. And then how do we constantly learn about the hard history, but find the power in the horrible stories, find the power in Emmett Till's mom and what she did to change the nation, to influence Rosa Parks to be brave enough to get on that bus. So many powerful things, but also to recognize people are fighting for their civil rights, for their human rights, but they're fighting for their dignity as a hum human being. And that's what it comes down to. And then it still comes down to those questions today. So I wanna thank you so much for being here in person, being with us online as you always are, and just a fantastic conversation today. Can ever get it to be, please give Professor Jeffries a big round of applause. Thank you everyone online. You had great questions online and thank you to all of our students in person. This is really fun doing the hybrid version. So have a great day, everybody. Happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Friday. Okay. <laughs>